of evidence for warming. There's a lot of evidence. The sea levels rise, the glaciers melt. There are a lot of clues that the planet's climate is changing. But very few of those clues tell us anything about what causes that warming. So what we're constantly beaten with is evidence of this warming, the mountain of evidence that the planet warmed. And people are just supposed to assume that if it warms, carbon dioxide has done it. But the evidence that carbon dioxide has done it comes back to really only one key point. And I'll explain some of that and David will expand on it. So here's this, this key point about whether we should be concerned about carbon or not. The climate models at the moment are the only things that are suggesting that carbon dioxide causes significant, scary, catastrophic warming. Did you know that CO2 itself only causes directly 1.2 degrees? That's when they say it's all based on physics. 100 year old physics, this is what they're talking about. 1.2 degrees of warming is what the carbon dioxide directly part does. Yes, it is a greenhouse gas. Yes, it causes some warming. Where's the rest of that coming from? They don't talk about one degree of warming. They talk about three to six degrees of warming. All of the scary numbers, all of the big numbers come from the models and the models assumptions that the world, as it warms, will get more humid and cloud patterns will change. And there's a lot of assumptions there about water vapour and clouds we all know how good the BOM is at predicting humidity and clouds. That's where the, the outlandish, the, the catastrophic predictions come from, the 3.5s, etc. et al. So most of that, the blue part of the graph is based on assumptions and estimates, their best guess. And the white part is based on the physics. So the crisis is really due to humidity and clouds, and they don't say that either. Just to give you a quick... Uh, a quick baseline idea of where we're at. The top 10 kilometres above us is mostly wet, damp air. Above that is the dry stratosphere. The very cold, thin, high atmosphere that's got this dry, essentially not much water in it. If humidity levels do rise because the world gets warmer and more water evaporates, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Then we would have a thicker hum hum humid blanket, or we might have a thicker humid blanket, or we might just have more low clouds and more rain. If we got a thicker humid blanket, it would be warmer. We all know humid nights are warmer, don't we? So that, that makes sense. But if it forms low clouds and they rain, or some other variation of clouds which rain, then we're not necessarily going to get any increased heat from that extra evaporation. This is what it comes down to, a guess about humidity and evaporation. And the models here, the models predicted and this is their chart from the CCSP 19, uh, sorry, 2006. The models predict this chart for our atmosphere. Hold on to your hat for a second. One side of that chart is the northern hemisphere, one is the southern, and the middle is the equator. So look up above the equator where most of the evaporation happens. Above the equator, we should see extra humidity, extra warming, faster than the ground, about 10 kilometres up at the top of that blanket of water. That's where it should be. All the models say that because that's how all their assumptions are built in. This is the key point. Now, it's so key that I'm going to leave it to David to show you what 28 million radiosondes show you. That's the big question mark. We've had 28 million radiosondes since 1959 going up through that atmosphere, sending back results. So we absolutely have a decent idea of what's going on at that level. And I'll leave David to show you that one because it's striking and it is the key point in the debate. This is a piece of nonsense evidence. CO2 rising at the same time as temperature does. We've all seen these graphs. You can generate them with any two monotonically rising lines just by changing the scales on the side to match. Change the scale, makes the lines match. I did a study like this. I showed that 72% of global warming is not due to carbon dioxide. 72% of the variation in global warming is actually due to US postage stamp price rises. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you think I'm kidding. Did you know in, 18, in 1880 you could post a letter for just two cents in the US? Now, the Homer Simpson release in 2009 meant 44 cents a letter. And look, every time the price of stamps went up, so did the temperatures. And look at CO2. And I'm using zeros on my baselines. No cheating here. The correlation is not causation. It just anyone can draw a tricky graph. So how did it come to this? This ridiculous state, of course, follow the money. So I did. 
I looked at how much money was paid to skeptics. $23 million is the largest number I've come across, thanks to Greenpeace. They say Exxon paid $23 million to skeptics. None of it came to me, unfortunately. So if anyone spots those missing checks, do let me know. Um, compared to that, the US government last year spent $7 billion. Now, they started in 1989 with $134 million on climate research, and it ramped up rapidly as Al Gore became the vice president. Can't think why. And nowadays, seven billion dollars or more a year go to climate-related research or renewable energy-related expenditure. There's a lot of scientists out there who are paid to find a crisis. So we paid to find a crisis, and we got what we paid for. <coughs> they pen all up seventy-nine billion dollars in science or technology related things to climate science. No wonder there's a steady stream of papers coming out day after day from institutes and organisations, honest, dutiful work, reporting on the pro-carbon tax scare side, but nothing on the other side. There's a vacuum. They didn't pay teams of people to find out that carbon didn't cause the warming. So we've got a monopoly in science. So this is how the cycle goes. Um, the government, say the White House and Al Gore, pours $79 billion into one theory. A bunch of scientists do the honest, pretty much pay what they do, they do what they're paid to do, and they produce one-eyed, bland, repetitive, largely relevant reports and occasionally something useful. And then journalists count all the press releases and say, oh my goodness, they must be right. There's a mountain of paper. I'm not going to read any of the details. I'll just say yes and rubber stamp it and let the public know we ought to be concerned. And then the cycle starts again. So it all starts to work in codes. And I must admit, most of the journalists think they're helping the planet, but they don't realise they're just serving the government instead of serving the people because they ought to be asking the hard questions, the really difficult questions of all the scientists, to say, but are you sure? Has anybody really questioned this? Is there another possible interpretation? They're not the ones coming to the Nobel Prize winners of physics who disagree and asking them why they disagree. How hard would it be for our ABC to phone Ivar Gieva, who won a Nobel Prize in 1972 in physics, and say, Ivar, tell me why you said global warming is the new religion? <coughs> and yet they haven't done it. They're not curious enough to track it down. Now, the vested interests in this are not the scientists. The scientists are small, minor vested interests, looking for grants and enjoying their junkets. But the big vested interests in this are, of course, the large financial houses, which dwarfs anything we've paid to scientists. And you name it, everyone, <coughs> Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Barclays Bank, HSBC, Deutsche Bank, we could list the entire financial sector. They've all got a carbon trading arm. Because if you're the broker on this deal, you make money. It doesn't matter who buys or who sells. It doesn't matter whether it's a low price or a high price. If you're the broker, you make money on every deal. They're talking about a potentially $2 trillion market if this became a global market, $2 trillion a year. The largest commodity, which is all the more hysterical because it's not a commodity. We're trading atmospheric nullities over the third world. Not like that's prone to fraud, is it? So, I mean, what percentage? Two percent of a two trillion dollar market? How much is that? It's just enough for the banks to get interested in the environment. Go on. When are they going to look at this? Carbon trading, 144 billion last year turned over in global markets. Yes, so much for the money paid to scientists. This is where the real money is at. Renewable energy, 243 billion invested last year. There's some big money for you. This is not just a gravy train, it's the global warming express to the money pit from hell. Deutsche Bank felt so compelled to help the environment, they put up a 70-foot high tower of doom in Madison Square Gardens to falling fish stocks, right? They're worried about humpback whales? When are they going to worry about humpback whales? When they can sell a humpback credit? <laughs> of course, it's to climate change. It's a carbon dioxide tower. And um, you can see, the bankers have been pushing this on co in Congress and through our government, they are very keen to get in a carbon trading system. Not so excited about a tax. Yes, there's our eco-heroes, and they think they're riding a green wave, ladies and gentlemen, but it's a different kind of green. 
Strictly a green back wave 